I feel very honored to be here, um, especially with all my two speakers before me, superstars in electrophysiology and in medicine. Um, I don't quite know what I'm doing here. <laughs> what I'm doing here is I stand here as a friend, and I'm very grateful for that. We've met, as you said, 20 years ago. Um, we've met together with Katrin and my wife. Maggie sends her warmest regards to both of you, and we hope to meet soon again. So when we talked about this, I can't really remember that I refused to talk about marathon runners. But it's not the topic that has kept me busy over the past two years. But I'm a cardiologist, and I'm also, that's how it's done in Germany, I'm also an intensive care medicine uh, person. And I'm in charge of that unit there. And um, I hope I don't bore you with taking you with me through the journey of the past two years, which is still an ongoing journey. Um, this is a paper from 2005, way before the current epidemic. And the title is important because it's all about ACE. You know, the song is all about the ACE, about the ACE, don't worry. It's, so it's actually where SARS attaches to. It's on the ACE2 receptor. Um, and what's written there in that paper is that's very similar to what we've seen early in the century with the SARS-1 pandemic, or epidemic, the locally one, and similar to what we see on the lungs a century ago with the Spanish flu. It's this diffuse alveolar damage that caused the problem. And this is on the and this receptor, this ACE2 receptor, was only covered, discovered in 2000. You see the one receptor, the, the SARS-1 receptor on the top left, and the SARS-CoV-2 receptor in the middle, and they overlap, they're very similar. But with a the difference, there's this bonding site, and it has a much higher affinity to the receptor, to the ACE2 receptor, than uh, the initial SARS-CoV-1 virus. And it's located at the lungs, at the heart, but also kidneys and the gastrointestinal uh, and, the, and the intestines. And what's important for this presentation, it's also sitting on the endothelium and on the surface cardiomyocytes. And that's how it enters these cells and it causes the damage. So this is the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, and we teach that all to our, all our medical students if they don't know what that is and if they can't um, explain it, then they will fail the exam. But was only discovered, again, not too long ago, what this ACE2 receptor, what it does, it converts the angiotensin 2, which is one of the most powerful vasoconstrictors that we have in the body, converts that into much less harmful angiotensin 1 to 7, and that, together with the mass receptor, uh, will in fact do something good on the endothelium. So it's a balance between the good and the bad, which is expressed here. And on the top left, you can see that there's a binding site on the ACE2 receptor, which is not there on the ACE1 receptor. Again, a different scheme. This is in the healthy person. There's angiotensin, angiotensin 1 being converted by ACE to angiotensin 2. It acts where the AT1 receptors and does harmful things. It's balanced by the other receptor, ACE2 via mass receptor from angiotensin 1 to 7, and cause vasodilation, vasoprotection, etc., etc. In SARS-CoV-2 infection, the ACE2 receptors downregulate it, paving way to the de deleterious effects of the ACE1. It's internalized into the cells, this is illustrated here, and there it causes the diffuse alveolar damage with all the difficulties we have eventually in breathing up to the problem of acute respiratory distress syndrome, the most severe form of lung failure. So this is again illustrated here with circulation paper very early in April 15, um, that there's a mismatch, a misbalance between the angiotensin two and the ends attention system, which produces inflammation. Reactive oxygen species increases vasoconstriction, so the vessels they constrict, and they cause thrombosis, or so clots in your vessels, and that is not a good thing. This is the first paper from Wuhan in the New England Journal, um, and it started all in Wuhan, and it's just 10 miles away from here, where we had the first case of um, COVID-19 in Germany, in Heinsberg, that was published on the 25th of February in 2000. Um, so even in this first paper, we learned 
that older age is a problem, that higher LDH level, LDH is an enzyme which we all uh, marker which is producing organ failure. D dimers are elevated when you have thrombosis formation, and that we when we first became aware of that. And we had at that time, um, early March, we have had our first patient at our clinic. So by that time, there have been media attention, and then we not long after that we had Bergamo images uh, spreading through Germany, and we became aware of that. We were fortunate enough that. I did my training at the University Clinic of Essen, and Essen is um, jumilated, so we have a friendly contact with the U of Wuhan University. And I called my friends at the anesthesiology department and knew that they had the first patients with acute respiratory failure. And I called them and said, hey, can I join you for a day or two to see what you're doing? And I remember standing there in the coffee break, and he said, Stefan, we just, two days ago, talked to our colleagues. They had a phone call with the colleagues in Wuhan, and they said, be aware, these patients do get thrombus. Be sure they don't just die of lung failure, they have a problem with thrombus formation on the vessels. So that's when we started giving heparin, and uh, there's a, the data. We knew even at that time that cortisone will help improve prognosis. Be assured we haven't learned much since then in, when it comes to this stage. I set out to publish that and to write down my experience. I got trained that you only know what you can write about. And I did that with Holger Thiele. He's the incoming president of the German Cardiovascular Society. And so we published a paper on how to ventilate these patients. And this is the first year of our experience at our clinic. By now, we have almost 1,500 patients hospitalized at our clinic. It's um, overlap now here of the green line is the incidence in the district of our area. And obviously, that runs in parallel with the incidence that we see of patients at our hospital. Now, what's unique at our place, in fact, that is quite unique German-wide, probably across Europe, that we didn't take all these patients, even with respiratory failure, to the intensive care unit, which isn't that big, but we had a 20 years, more than 20 years of experience with non-invasive respiration. And so it was our pneumologist who, from the first day, only said, these patients don't, don't need to be intubated. It was a difficult time in sorting that out because the guidelines said something else. Because of staff protection, we didn't know how dangerous it was to us. It was a very, you all might remember the problems we, that we had in the initial weeks of this pandemic. Um, then the second wave, or the third wave, which is was, that is where the problem started, and the red bars are the patients that ended up on our intensive care unit. So these were, during the first year, 60 patients, bit more than half of them, a few more were men, aged 66 years old, and we only saw them at our intensive care unit when they had at least moderate or severe, mostly, um, respiratory failure. This mortality, and we tend to forget that. It's mainly mortality in the older people. When I had the disease, in fact, I wasn't that ill that I couldn't take the phone call, but it was difficult to get hold of me. But what was a problem that I was at the clinic between Christmas and New Year's Eve, and I was in the intensive care unit. I saw my patients everywhere, no matter how much you protect yourself. Um, and I did very careful protection for myself. We were there at home, there were regulations, there was just the five of us, which is myself, my wife, two children, and my mother-in-law. I was running on New Year's Eve. And I came home and said, I don't really feel well, but then you don't feel well having eaten so much over Christmas time. Um, and obviously, our entire family, we tested ourselves almost twice daily during that time. I was safe. On the 1st of January, I couldn't go running. On the 2nd of uh, January, my test became extremely positive immediately. By that time, we had sat there with the entire family. My entire family was ill. We didn't have a problem, all of us, except my mother-in-law. She's over 80, and that's why I'm showing this. She's over 80. She survived, luckily. It was very close. So I knew what COVID is from our own experience. We were fortunate 
that she survived, she would come to us on vacation and she's very well again. But then we have to realize that even when you're, and that is on the right panel there, even when you're above 80, you have still have a very good chance to survive. It's not, it was felt in the public attention that if you catch that once you're 70 or above, you're almost dead, which is not true. Even when you're above 80, your mortality is only, which is still very bad, but it's just 20%. So four out of five do survive. Fortunately, my mother-in-law included that. This is our experience now. Um, this is, don't take this for granted, what it shows that with, with deteriorating lung function from the left to the right bar, this index there, the PO2 over F IO2, which means it's the oxygen fraction in the blood per fraction of inhaled oxygen. So how much oxygen do you have to put in to get a certain amount of oxygen in the blood? So the lower the index is, the poorer your lung is. And so it's not surprising that with deteriorating lung function, the intubation rate goes up and mortality goes up. But especially during the initial year, those were measurements people would, in other institutions, would be intubated. So we wouldn't even have figures on the prognosis, on the graded relationship between deteriorating lung function and intubation and eventually mortality. We found that LDH, measure of organ failure, IL-6, mark, mark of inflammation, the severity of lung failure, uh, were predictors of outcome, even in the small group of patients. Of course, age and sex were also important, but didn't um, uh, reach statistical significance. But also, when you were on non-invasive ventilation for more than five days outside intensive care unit and didn't get better, but were, had reasons to be transferred to intensive care unit, your prognosis was really, really poor. So the lesson that we have learned there is it's a, this non-invasive ventilation. It's a very good thing in the early stages of disease. You can deal with it, keep the patient awake. They are these happy hypoxics. Um, you keep them awake, you keep them on the ventilation, but when they don't improve on that, then you have to be very careful, have to get them to intensive care unit under very close um, observation because then it's when they get complications. There's an image on that. I'll skip that for reasons of time, but this is a patient which I, I hope I can show you this, yes. This is a patient who came not to us with respiratory failure, but, but with acute coronary syndrome. He had chest pain. What did he have? He had this image in the middle, where you can see here the left coronary artery, and there sitting this blood clot. On the right, it, does it move this image? I'm not sure. Yes, there it is. It's a very poor left ventricular function, and we have this blood clot sitting there. We had to take it out a day later because it was swept away into the femoral artery. On the left is his CT chest image, very dirty chest image. He had then, over the time, deteriorating lung function. I believe that he then also developed myocarditis, which is very difficult to prove in these patients because you can't really get them into the MR scanner. Of course, he had elevated troponins, which is a marker of myocardial cell death, and which is, of course, the case in acute myocardial infarction. It is one example of a typical case with very heterogeneous clinical picture. It's very difficult to eventually stay able to make of it. He then developed AV block third degree, and he died on an intensive care unit. Very tragic case. We have several of those. With acute myocarditis, is... Sure. Oh, I'm sorry. Very good question. That is the heart. You have here the left ventricle. This is the mitral valve. This is the left atrium. And there, in the middle of the left ventricle, you have this huge uh, blood clot. And uh, what does the HX mean? Both are X-ray schizophrenia. What is the 
history of. History of schizophrenia and anxiety, which makes this case even more problematic. He wasn't fit enough. He didn't he just refuse to go to intensive care unit because he had to be in a separate, separated room. At the time, we didn't have vaccination, so we asked his wife to be exposed to the viral load, sit with his, her husband into the room, etc. It was a drama. I have tens of cases and 20 of cases that are dramatic. I don't want to live through this again. And then you sit there, are responsible for these patients, and you really don't know what to do and try the best you can to keep them alive. Do you mean what? The, I mean the thrombus. No, the thrombus, good that you ask again. The thrombus formation is because of what I initially tried to explain, the virus attaches to the ACE2 receptor on the endothelium. And because of the mismatch between the good and the bad protection and harmful system on the endothelium, you damage the endothelium, and that's where the cl blood clots start. That's where the blood attaches to the endothelium, and there are protective mechanisms which then overreact and form a blood clot and close the arteries. In fact, what we do see in usually a pulmonary embolism is something where it starts usually in the deep veins of the legs, it spreads to the lungs and that clots the, uh, the lung and you have a big problem. That's different in this scenario. It starts in the epithelium. It starts clotting in the lungs, in the periphery. In the periphery. And in, a, in addition to what happens in the alveoli, the little bubbles that, you know, where we inhale the oxygen, there is a problem in the alveoli, in these bubbles, they are blocked. In addition, we have the blockage of the arteries and you have if that is an overwhelming scenario, you don't have a chance to save these patients. And that's so difficult to distinguish myocarditis from microthrombus also in the heart. You can't do biopsy in these patients because they're usually too ill. And this here is, an, is a publication just recently, a few weeks ago, published in circulation. There, they did in fact myocardial um, so f the magnetic resonance imaging, they did myocardial biopsies, did all the troponin levels, but what you can see here, 57% of those did not have acute lung injury. If they had acute and severe lung injury, you wouldn't be able to do all these tests, at least not with a huge effort. So what it shows if you have myocarditis in the setting of um, COVID-19, then you have a death rate of 6.6% on the top left. If it's without pneumonia, the prognosis is very good. If you have pneumonia, then the mortality goes up to 15%. If you then, in addition, have such bad myocarditis that you need temporary mechanical circulatory support, that's what this abbreviation means, your mortality rate is 20%. Again, if you have no pneumonia, then you're much better off as if you have also pneumonia, then the mortality increases to 37%. Be aware that the incidence of myocarditis is just two to four per thousand hospitalizations. In the majority of cases, as with all types of myocarditis, and that is important for everyone here, with all cases of myocarditis, usually they appear subclinically, so you, feel you don't feel well, but you stay at home. You rest, and two weeks later, you're better. I'm sure that I've had some little form of myocarditis when I was that ill. Can you still hear me? Yes. So, in the majority of cases, it's not a problem. But if you come to hospital and have a severe cause of myocarditis, then you're really bad off. This is now a shift towards that was acute problem of the heart and the lung. Now the long-term cardiovascular outcomes in COVID-19. There's a paper just published in Nature Medicine almost 150 or a little more than 150,000 COVID-19 patients and they followed them for a year and they were able to compare that 
to a very large cohort of contemporary patients and historic controls, and they looked for all different types of cardiovascular diseases. What is important, even from the 30 days after the infection, up to one year after the infection, it's a very high prevalence of cardiovascular causes and diseases of all types, whether it's cerebrovascular, whether it's arrhythmia, inflammatory and non-inflammatory and ischemic heart disease or thrombotic disorders, it's all elevated. So as cardiologists, we have to be aware that these patients after COVID-19 infection, that they do get problems even though they may not have been there initially. Um, and the risk, and this is what this slide shows, is much higher if you have been on intensive care unit, lower when you have been hospitalized, and fairly low if you didn't require hospitalization initially. So there is this hype about myocarditis, and everyone, the two of you will see that in your clinic every day that you get these patients who have anxiety because they have this little arrhythmia, this little ventricular extrasystole, which is no problem at all. You just ignore it. But they are afraid that they now have this severe form of myocarditis. And you need a lot of explanation to do and say, hey, it's not that bad. Relax. But be aware, in some cases, it in fact can be a problem. This is an interesting study from friends of mine from Frankfurt who looked prospectively at all, it's an all comer study, and those who were transferred to them to their practice for suspected um, myocarditis um, after they had uh, survived and, and without problems post-COVID. Um, and they found, they did this MR study, and they found that out of all these 56 cases, there was only one where they had actually evidence of, myocard of myocarditis. In all the others, they couldn't prove an association. So what they, in fact, stated was these data provide some reassurance in symptomatic patients on their risk of myocardial inflammation. It argues against routine use of expensive modalities such as CMR in all these patients. So when your left ventricular function is good, if you don't have um, elevated troponins, yeah, and if, if you don't feel that bad, you're safe. Watch and wait. Last topic, risk of myocarditis associated with vaccination. Again, that hit the press quite intensely. We all were suddenly afraid that we could have problems with vaccination. So many people who refused to get vaccinated because they saw, thought it could pr uh, cause a problem to the heart in terms of myocarditis. And this is a paper that puts it all to, into perspective. Again, Nature Medicine article recently published. They looked at almost 20,000 20 million persons with AstraZeneca, 17 million with BioNTech Pfizer, 1 million with Moderna, and then 3 million to comparison with SARS-CoV-2 infection uh, for comparison. What this shows is that especially myocarditis, pericarditis, and arrhythmia occur in the infection, but not with vaccination. Except, and that's the left panel here, if you're younger, below 40, and you are vaccinated with Moderna, then you have a little elevated, well, considerably elevated risk of myocarditis in association with the vaccination. So, which led to the recommendation that young persons shouldn't be vaccinated with Moderna, but you're safe with the um, uh, other vaccines um, and it should be uh, done um, in the majority of all cases of patients. So, in summary, the SARS-CoV-2 enters the cell via the ACE2 receptor. It may cause problematic disease of the lung and the heart. All groups are affected, but mortality is increased in the old, older age groups, especially in the presence of risk factors such as overweight, hypertension, diabetes, which are all very frequent, as you know. Mortality is high in RDS in uh, lung failure and increases further when other organs are affected. The incidence of cardiovascular disease after one year is considerable. You have to be aware of that. It may occur, but don't overdo diagnostics. Usually, um, it's not myocarditis if you have some arrhythmia um, after 
uh, COVID-19. Vaccination is a good thing. Yes, you may have rarely myocarditis, um, but it's much lower than the risk associated with the infection itself. So do protect yourself, do get vaccinated, uh, and lead a heavy, ha very happy life after this. Thank you, Frank, for having me here. I hope it was didn't bore you today, and uh, thank you for being guests here on this fascinating event. Thank you very much. <laughs>